Hey guys, hope you're having a great week. I enjoyed seeing you on Monday and I look forward to seeing you this um, Monday for Halloween. Hope you all have good costumes. Um, so last week we touched on three um, key verses kind of around the subject of follow, go, and build. Um, following Jesus and then his command to go. And then the third part was kind of the, the section on build and that was kind of about being used as God's resource. Um, and so we're kind of going to continue that whole conversation um, progressing on our purpose. And so this week's called Living on Purpose. Um, so if you want to grab your um, sheet or grab your Bible, we're going to start off with Romans 8, 28 through 31. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, whom have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among them, among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? So I, I kind of picked this verse, I mean, one is like one of my favorite verses just because it's full of so much hope. Um, it's one of the worship songs we sing, so it's probably a little familiar. Um, but kind of the whole, the whole thing about it is it says that God basically has his master plan. We weren't here just by chance. You know, he's put us aside and um, thought of us before we were even born. Not only did he create us in the image of his own son, but he also um, created us in a, a specific birth order, kind of like almost thinking about we've been picked with our family for a reason. And I know sometimes we fight with our family, but, but God had a reason for it. Um, you know, we have the brothers and, brothers and sisters we do for a reason. We have the parents we do for a reason. Um, and just like he's predestined us into the, the, the family and the place where we are, he's also called us. So each of us has a specific calling. Um, not only that, but then it goes in and saying he justifies us. So he equips us through our life and he affirms that the calling we have is the calling, you know, that he has for us. And then in the end, he glorifies us. So it's kind of like we get the reward in the end. Um, and then after it jumps through all this, it says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And I think that's just like one of those awesome lines that just makes you feel like, you know, you don't have to fear the world and all the tragic stuff that's going on. And I think that's really hard to do sometimes when all the disasters are happening or rough things are going on in your life. But really, when you can remember that you're here for a reason and that there is a purpose and a plan in place by God, it makes things um, more comfortable. It makes them more hopeful to know that, you know, you're not just alone here, that God's with you and he has a purpose for everything. Um... So I'm just going to kind of keep going and jump through. You can fill out the, the questions that kind of follow up with these verses on your own time if you want, or you can pause the video. So the second verse is Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I think I'm just going to start at the end. It says God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. And I think sometimes it's hard, you know, just we talked about tragedy, and, and sometimes it's hard to know that things are, you know, for a reason. But they are, and it's important to know that God has a, a good and a pleasing and a perfect will for us. Um, that doesn't mean we're not going to go through trouble or trials, but that means that the purpose he has for us is good. The, the point of, um, you know, the whole world and all that stuff, there's an underlying theme of goodness, but that doesn't mean there's not evil and, and corruption in the world. Um, and so going back to the top, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. And so I think the word transformed is kind of a little bit harder to grasp here. So I just want to sub it out with the word change. So um, instead of saying, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be changed by the renewing of your mind. And renewing your mind is kind of also odd. Um, and I would kind of sub in the, the concept of like training or teaching or learning um, and thinking of instead of renewing your mind, just training your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve. And instead of test and approve, I would put determine. So I'm just going to read this over, um, kind of subbing in these words. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be changed by the training of your mind. Then you will be able to determine what God's will is. And I think that is often something we struggle with. Like, we know that God has us here for a reason, and we know that there's a purpose for our life. But what is his will in either a certain situation or a certain time in our life or what college we're going to go to? 
It's like, we're always trying to figure out, man, what does God want me to do? If you just come down in front of me and tell me, then I'd be able to do that. But it doesn't seem like he does that as much as he did back in, in the good old days of the Bible. So it's, it can be frustrating. And so I think in this verse, he tells us two things we need to do. He says, one, do not conform to the pattern of the world. So the first thing we have to do is we have to say, I follow Jesus and I'm going to, you know, separate myself from the world and follow him. So even if there's a social norm that it's going to be me kind of feeling like an outcast, I'm still going to choose to follow God and follow his way. Um, and then the second thing we have to do is it says we need to change, um, be changed by the training of our minds. So if you kind of think about that, um, a lot of times it can feel like we give into temptation or we're so easily swayed by this and that of the world. But really what we have to do is we have to train ourselves and we have to be um, changed by that. So we have to learn, okay, what is right and what is wrong? What does God want us to do in, in certain situations? And we get that training from being around other Christians and getting into the Word, you know, Bible studies, coming to things like Element and just growing in our personal relationship with God. And, and it follows up and it says when we do these things, when we don't conform to the world and when we learn, when we grow in our, our life, our walk with God, He's going to show us His will. We're going to be able to determine that. And so I think that's just a really awesome thing because it's not just telling you, oh, God's will is pleasing or God's will is good, but it's saying this is what you have to do to understand God's will. And I think that's not um, something instantly that's going to happen. Sometimes that's a process we have to go through. We have to separate ourselves from the world and then we have to grow with God. And that can be hard and there's going to be times where you're going to feel like a kind of a tension between going with what you think the world wants you to say and, and their standards versus going with God's standards. Um, and I think once you start to, start to figure out and be able to balance that and be able to say, you know, at certain times it's okay to kind of give in to the way the world is. I mean, dating wasn't in the Bible, but we kind of give in to that. But then there's other things like lying and cheating and, you know, impure thoughts and all that kind of stuff that I would say is really like, you know, you just have to separate yourself from the world and we have to change our mind and, and just grow with God so that we can determine His will for our life. And uh, the closer we are, you know, with God, I think it's the easier to understand what He wants us to do. Um, but that's that's a lifelong journey. I think I've met people that are 15 and they know what they want to do, and then I've met people that are like 50 and they don't even still know what they want to do with their life. So I think it's just an encouraging thing because it gives us something to do. Um, and I know, it's like for me as a guy, like I, I, it's hard to have a problem and not know and not want to fix it. So. To me, this verse is encouraging because it gives me some sort of action plan to kind of go forth and do. Um, and so then the third verse we're going to jump into, if you want, you can pause it again and fill out the questions. Um, the third verse is 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So this verse is comparing... Um, you know, the, the life or the purpose of being a Christian with the purpose of an athlete or a runner, I guess, in this case. And so it's saying that multiple people go into a race, multiple people, um, you know, go into a marathon, but there's only one winner. And that's crazy because you think, you know, if like 5,000 people will run in one marathon or something crazy like that, but only one actually wins. And it's saying that just like that with Christians, a lot of people go into the race but only one person comes out as a winner. And I don't think it's not one, but, but the, perp, the point of kind of that visual thinking is that a lot of people say they're a Christian or say they're, they're running the race, but not that many people actually win and actually like medal in, in it, if that makes sense. Um, and I think that's hard to think about because I feel like a lot of times the world wants us to accept this answer that everyone who believes in God is going to go to heaven. But the Bible clearly states over and over that that's not the case. Um, and that's, that's a hard thing that I've struggled with because I always, you know, want to think of the people that I know that believe in God that aren't living the way that they're supposed to are still going to heaven. And 
you know, before we even go into that, I just want to say you cannot judge them. You know, it, it's up to God to be the one who's going to determine who wins and who loses. But it's one of those things that the purpose of this verse isn't really to be judging other people. It's to be reflecting on ourselves. So we know that a bunch of runners are going to run and only one's going to run pr win the race. Um, but it says that everyone who actually, you know, goes into this game goes into strict training. And I think that's one, that's kind of what's going to separate in my eyes the difference between the ones who might not quite make it and the ones who do make it. It's the training, the knowledge. If you actually know what you need to do, you know, to get there, and if you're actually training and practicing and working at it continually, you're going to have a better chance at winning. You know, you don't, you don't wake up in the morning and just say, hey, I'm going to run a marathon today. No, you're not going to win. You're not even probably going to be able to finish. And I, th I think that's kind of the point. You have to be able to know what and practice and go into this training. Um, and so it says they do it to get the crown that will not last, but we do it to get the crown that will last forever. So heaven lasts forever or eternal life. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike and blow. I, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. So this whole concept of running aimlessly, I think is kind of like the point of why I put this verse in there. If you think about running aimlessly, you're just kind of like a feather in the wind. You don't have direction. You're just kind of like, oh, going this way and that way and this way, but you're not staying on the course and the track. And I think that's the whole point of living on purpose is because if you have a goal, um, like a marathon, you're running 26 miles, you know the course and you're, you're going. Whereas in life, it's a little bit more complicated, but you still have to put those same goals in place. What, you know, is my goal to be, um, you know, a youth pastor? Is my goal to be a worship leader? Is my goal to be, you know, I don't know, a guitar, um, like a famous computer science, like Steve Jobs or something? You know, we, we can all have these, like, goals in mind. If my goal is to just, you know, serve the purpose of the kingdom and just do whatever, you know, is going to glorify God, there's all these different types of goals we can have. Um, this specifically is going into just talking about being a Christian and following Jesus. And we, we need to have that purpose and that goal in mind so that we're not running aimlessly. Because if we don't have that goal and that purpose in mind, it's going to be harder to not conform to the world. We're just going to be like a feather in the wind. If somebody says, hey, let's go you know, smoke some weed, you're going to be like, all right, cool, because you don't have a purpose or a goal um, that you're striving towards every day. And, and it follows it up and it says, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. You know, if you were, um, if you're a boxer and you're going into training, they're, they're punching bags, they're punching each other. Versus if you're just hitting at the wind, you're not really getting anywhere. Um, and so it's like, I don't know if you guys have ever had one of those dreams where there's some bad guy or something and you go to hit him, but your arm's just not moving. Or you go to run and you just can't run, you're just stuck. And I kind of feel like that whole um, concept with the whole box, box you're beating the air. Um, and it's, it's kind of the same thing with the feather in the wind. If you have a purpose and you have something set forth, um, you know, you go into this strict training. Um, and it follow, in the next line it says you, you're, you beat your body and you make it your slave. And I think that's really um, key when you talk about not conforming to the world and not giving in to temptation because our bodies naturally, you know, conform to sin. They want to commit sin. They want to, you know, have sex all the time and do all these crazy things and drugs and whatever. But it's our mind, you know, and the training of our mind to have self-control over our bodies. We're the ones that are, you know, we have to say that we're in control, you know, we have a purpose for God and we're not going to let just our, um, you know, sinful nature just take over and go wild because we know that we have a greater prize that's going to last forever. Um, and then what else do we have here? So then it says, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified by the, for the prize. And I think that is... Um, it's awesome. I mean, this is Paul talking, and he's saying that I have preached to others. So this is like thinking of like a pastor, um, and you're kind of like, wait, he could not be disqualified from the prize. How could a you know a pastor not go to heaven? But the thing is, if if he's you know spending all his time working on other people's salvation, you know, he could leave his own you know his own salvation and and just not even think about it, not have his own quiet times, not be growing spiritually. All he's doing is working on other people's lives and. Therefore, by the time, you know, his life is over, he hasn't done the things that he was supposed to and he hasn't lived the life according to God's plan for him. And so I think one of the things to analyze here is just like, you know, we're looking at an athlete versus a Christian. 
And so if you think about an athlete, I don't know if you guys play, have ever played any school sports or anything, but back when I played, um, I played soccer and we, we practiced, I, it wasn't part of the school, but it was, um, you know, a club. We practiced three to four times a week for like three hours a day or three hours each practice. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't, I probably don't even work on my relationship with God that much. And that's sad to me because I think like, you know, winning a soccer game versus going to heaven, you know, there's like no comparison to those two. But we're so willing to, you know, give up all these hours to a sport or, a, a, you know, a, a music or an art or something like that versus it's so hard for us to give 10, 15, 20 minutes of, you know, our devotional time to God. And so, um, you know, the first thing we have to do when we're kind of looking at all this stuff is say, one, do I want to follow God? And if I do, I have to realize that that doesn't just mean I believe in God. That means I have to actually put forth effort and put forth, you know, a vision and kind of like go throughout my life, always coming back to this idea that God is who I'm following and this is the purpose of my life. Um, and I think a lot of times we can think of purpose for our life as being a career. But I think the kind of the basic purpose of our life that we all have to kind of come back to is our faith and our foundation. Am I going to live my life for the world or am I going to live my life for God? And so that's kind of where I kind of was going with this whole theme of living on purpose. Um, and, and that's what I want, to, want you guys to think about. What's, you know, throughout the next few days, what's the difference between believing in God and following God? How does that look? Um, and where would you say you're at? And you don't have to share that with other people, but I just want you guys to think about that. Right now, do you feel like you lean more towards believing in God or following God? Um, and just like it says, a lot of runners run, and a lot of people say they believe in God, but how many people actually follow Him? And, um, you know, put His will above their own and, and kind of not give in to those temptations because they're going to say, I'm going to stand up and have more self-control. So I just want you guys to think about that. Um, and then, you know, next week, that's kind of what we're going to dive into more is what does it actually look like to follow God? Once we've made that choice to not only believe in Him, but to follow Him, uh, what does that look like? And how does that, how does that work? So this kind of, um, you know, foundational stuff with the, the Christian faith, but I think it's really important, you know, as we're going to be, you know, a student leadership group and hopefully... In the future, we're going to be discipling other um, members of the of the church and other youth. I think it's important for us to know these things and kind of figure out where we're at and just start the process of growing. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see you guys on Monday. Halloween should be fun. Um, I hope you have a good costume. I'm not sure if I'm going to dress up or not. I haven't decided, but but yeah, hope you have a great one. And also, the Rangers game is about to be on, so you should watch it. <laughs> All right, you guys have a good one. Mm -hmm.